call the December 14th meeting of the Hingham School Committee to order to um, interview superintendent candidates. So welcome. So tonight we have Dr. Margaret Adams to start. Um, so currently, Dr. Gary Maestas is serving as interim superintendent of the Hingham Public Schools following the resignation of Dr. Paul Austin at the end of June. Dr. Austin was hired in 2019 after the retirement of Dr. Dorothy Gallo, who served as superintendent for 18 years. The committee is seeking a new superintendent with the vision to harness the many strengths of the Hingham Public School System while moving the district forward. So for the interview format, we have a 90 minute interview planned with about 16 questions. Uh, and so we'd ask you to gear your response time accordingly. Um, there's a clock right there for your convenience so you can see. And we're gonna go around the table, we each have two questions to ask. Um, and if we have time, we, we, have a few, we may have a few follow-up questions, and we also asked um, the community to submit questions, too. And anyone here tonight who have, has a question for any of the candidates, there's a form right there, so you can uh, fill it out and hand it to Tim. So I will start us off. Um, we've read all your materials, and some of us have had the opportunity to get you know, to know you a little better as we toured you around the district, district today. So could you please take two minutes to tell us a little more about yourself, your career, and why Hingham? Um, so you can see um, in my um, resume that I'm currently the assistant superintendent for teaching and learning in Melrose. I've been there 10 years, um, and I've loved my work there. I lead efforts in the district around diversity and equity and inclusion, have led the efforts in the district towards reimagining and rethinking how we do school and really trying to position us towards um, 21st century, um, really developing in our students the skills they're gonna to need to be successful. Um, and w we have a vision for personalized learning that we've integrated into our strategic plan, um, into our technology plan, um, as well as trying to develop a diversity and equity um, plan that will help propel those um, efforts um, and our goals forward. Um, why Hingham? I, I saw that you're trying to think and do that similar work. You're at the beginning stages. And I really felt um, that I had some skills um, and knowledge um, to share with Hingham and helping you propel those similar goals as you begin your own process of, of thinking of, about how do you prepare your young people for the 21st century and as well as think about um, how to create equitable learning environments for all of your students. I have the next question. Are you here tonight, Dr. Adams? Um, Hingham has undergone and continues to undergo many changes in leadership over the past few years, uh, including the addition of several new central office positions. What will be your approach toward hiring new leadership team members? Additionally, those new leaders will require a great deal of coaching or onboarding and mentoring support. How do you approach mentoring coaching in your current district? And could you give us some examples of maybe two times that you've sort of successfully mentored someone and maybe a time when it didn't work out so well, and sort of what were the outcomes? Yeah, I've, I've learned from times it hasn't worked well, um, and mostly it's, um, it's not enough communication and not enough um, supports in place to support the person. Um, and, and, and sometimes you're rushed in your process for hiring. Um, so I've learned a lot from that in the past, and we are very intentional, I'm, I'm very intentional in my hiring practices involving um, as many teachers as possible to be involved in. We've hired several curriculum leaders in the last um, six months, um, new um, and replacing some. And in the 10 years I've been there, I've, I've hired many curriculum leaders um, as part of my role um, and have supported the hiring of several um, principals in the district. Um, I try to involve as many teachers as possible um, also involve um, parents and educators and students. Um, I feel like the student voice is something we've done in the last two years. It's really helped, um, really, because students often see things that we don't see and have a perspective that's important um, and valued um, and sort of a, a, just a different perspective they add to the conversation. Um, the hiring process also, um, I've learned also that um, really thinking, one of the things we're thinking about in Melrose is how do we ensure that we have diverse candidates, thinking about how do we have our staff be reflective of our student body. And one of those pieces is really being clear on those hiring processes. And um, one of the things we found helpful is giving performance tasks to folks so that we give a task like, um, you know, prepare a staff meeting 
um, and share 10 minutes of it. So we really get a sense of who the person is. Um, one of the things we're also talking about is even providing candidates the questions beforehand. So what are we really trying to assess when we do an interview? Are we trying to assess the person who's like on the spot and can answer quick? Or do we really want to assess the content? And trying to think about how we make our processes more equitable. I supervise about 10 to 12 um, curriculum directors now. Um, and I um, meet with them on a monthly basis. We schedule about a two and a half hour meeting every month and we walk their classrooms and the buildings um, and talk about teaching and learning. At the same time, we're brainstorming and thinking about what are the next steps for the department to move forward, reflecting upon their own goals and the goals of the district, and what are the resources they need in order to be successful and start brainstorming. And then we check in on those every month. I follow up each one with an email and say, these are the things we talked about, here are the next steps we discussed, and sort of trying to push the department forward and teaching and learning forward, um, as well as being cognizant of all the great work that's, that we did see in the classrooms and really recognizing um, and celebrating that as well. There was another part to that question that I'm missing. Successful time, and maybe um, it was unsuccessful. I think one of the things that I did about three years ago is we started, I started meeting with just new administrators, a separate meeting. Um, because I felt that they were getting pieces of information and not all the information that they needed. So the last three years, I've been meeting on a monthly basis just with any new administrator in the district, whether they be an assistant principal or, or under my supervision, direct supervision. Um, and that way, I can support them in sort of some of the work we've done in the past. For example, as a leadership team, we did a lot of work around having common practices around our evaluation of teachers. Um, and structuring our feedback in similar ways. So there was a predictability um, to what we were doing when we, when we went into teachers' classrooms. Um, and we spent, as a leadership team, almost two years working on that, bringing our uh, feedback and having, reading each other's feedback and um, giving um, um, suggestions to each other. And so the folks who are new never got that experience. Um, and so meeting with them on a monthly basis we're able to like fill in some of the information that others have. Um, so this past month we met and we talked about some of the district's work over the last five years around SEL, social emotional learning and around positive behavior intervention systems so that when they're working with teachers, they can reinforce some of the work that we've done in the past. So I think as a result of them, of sort of feeling our new folks weren't getting all of that historical professional development sort of a deep understanding of what was happening in the district. And you can't overwhelm them all in the summer <laughs> when they've been hired. So by doing it little by little, they're getting pieces of the information and also being responsive to what their needs are. So at this last meeting, one of the things they said that they needed was more information about the district's processes around 504s. Um, so that will be our topic for January is sort of helping them understand the district's processes for 504s, as well as some procedural pieces that they feel like they just don't have enough information on. As you may know, Hingham appropriated nearly 9% budget increase for fiscal 22, supported by one-time funds, which will not be available in the long term. The increase will result in a town-wide revenue deficit for fiscal 23 and beyond without an operational override to continue the supports being funded. Municipal and school leaders are currently working together to assess future needs, explore additional revenue opportunities, including, including consideration of a Proposition 2.5 operational override, and to identify ways to sustainably fund the budget going forward. Could you give an example of how you have worked with your school committee and the community to state your case for budget needs and what, if any, experience you have in successfully working with a community to gain support for a fully funded school budget. And as a follow-up, how do you define, define and justify wants and needs when available dollars cannot cover all requests? So I really believe that in the budget process, you, we want to create two narratives, and they kind of run parallel with each other. We need to create a narrative, narrative in the schools of all the great things that are happening so that um, um, families can see the things that are happening in the classrooms um, and the efforts of, of teachers and educators, 
as well as taxpayers can see the impact of tax dollars, right? So here's the impact of that 9%, and this is how it's being used and creating that narrative um, in the community. And that has to be done in nowadays in multiple ways. In the past, it would have been a newsletter would have been enough. It's not. Um, it has to be on social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, Facebook. It has to be through your PTOs, um, through your school site council. So you want everybody sharing this information. Highlighting in short snippets, longer snippets, it has to be an ongoing um, piece. One of the things we also do at school committee um, in Melrose is we have a rolling agenda that allows us to showcase and highlight both the school committee but the wider community some of the work we're doing. So we go on a yearly basis and prevent, present our professional development plan. We present our information, um, our, our progress toward our technology plan. Um, we go and present um, um, curriculum at different points in the year. And, and we're using that as a way to sort of showcase the great work that's happening. And at the same time, creating a narrative of what are the needs. And developing through those presentations and through the information that's being shared, saying, huh, these are the needs of the schools, um, and we need resources to identify, um, to meet them. For example, at the, um, a couple weeks ago, I was at school committee presenting on MCAS um, results from this fall. And at, while I'm showing information, we also shared information on our fall assessment data and how our students did um, in our um, benchmark assessments. And at that time saying and really highlighting that our grade one and grade two students really are struggling. Um, their fall data shows they had the most impact. Um, all of our grades were impacted in some way. And creating a narrative, hey, the resources, we were able to allocate 15 part-time academic interventionists to our elementary schools, saying this is why we needed those folks, and those folks are really working hard. And we've already looked at November data, and that November data says those interventions are, make, are working. And really highlighting to taxpayers and families is saying, yes, that data is concerning to us, but we're seeing progress. And by the way, we need those 15 people to come back next year. Those 15 people are so important. So we need to create that parallel narrative saying, hey, that's important. And these are our needs. At the same time, I'm highlighting the social emotional learning needs of the students and saying those young people in grades one and two in K, we're seeing the impact of the pandemic um, in their social emotional learning needs, their executive functioning skills, um, and trying to create a narrative for the additional social emotional learning um, resources that we're gonna need as a district. Um, the operational override was the second part, I think, of that um, question, is um, in Melrose we were successful, not with our first operational override, but our second. Um, our first one was sort of, uh, was paired with a project that didn't have community support. Um, the second one was um, paired up with fire um, and police additional resources. So because it was paired with that, um, and also we were able to um, mobilize our Ed Foundation um, grassroots organizing that they were able to do to raise money for the schools through the foundation to also galvanize and move that group um, to do some grassroots organizing in the community that allowed us to successfully um, have an operational override. Um, and it was through that working in conjunction is um, as leaders in the school sort of saying, we're just describing, we're not telling you how to vote, but we're saying here's the impact of what happens if this, oper if this override doesn't happen. We're gonna lose staff, we're gonna lay off staff. Um, your sports um, fees will go up even further. These are in laying out what needed to be done. We actually had two budgets going on at that time. We were presenting a budget um, to school committee without the operational override and really showing the impact and creating over several months that narrative. Um, but we had another budget um, on the side. So if the um, override happen, um, happened, what would that um, budget? So we had two budgets going on that year um, to really paint the narrative of what would happen in the schools. Um, and luckily we were quite successful, but it took a lot of sort of a lot of folks at the table and continual conversation about really creating that parallel narrative. Great. Our district is considered to be a high performing district. 
We also have many areas in which we compare well below our benchmark communities, including performance of high need students, administrative support, one-to-one -one device programming, uh, lack of a fine arts director, and others. We are embarking on a strategic plan to analyze our programs and gain insight from the community about what it wants for our schools. Please explain your experience developing and implementing a strategic plan for your district, and please tell us how it addressed issues to implement and ones to change. Led those efforts. I think I've, we have. Um, I think I have probably three strategic plans <laughs> under my belt now in Melrose, um, and the last one I'm most proud of because I feel like it tried to galvanize and put together all of the um, um, work that we had previously done. And so, in that um, strategic plan, we were able to incorporate personalized learning, some of our goals, some of our goals around um, culturally proficient um, teaching, um, were also integrated. Um, and that happens with sort of making sure that we're reaching multiple stakeholders, um, engaging the community and sort of getting feedback um, around what they feel are the goals, what's the current status of the schools through surveys, um, then um, engaging a group of stakeholders to help develop that plan, um, and then working through what those goals are with really strategic actions. Um, over the, um, th we've, we have a three-year plan and decided to do a three-year plan um, three years ago. And we felt like three years is probably what, what works because we're constantly changing and evolving. Education is changing so fast. I'm not sure how someone could write a five-year plan because I think after three years, we're already failing two years. We did have a pandemic in the middle of it um, that um, we are we are adjusting. Um, even our technology goals um, that we set for three years, like we met in the first year, and that was because of the pandemic. Um, so, and I think it's really clear. It's it's we go to school committee and um, present updates um, on an ongoing basis, three to four times a year, on the strategic plan. Last year we only did it once, but, um, but our hope is to do it m multiple times this year because that presents an opportunity for the community to hear and to, to keep the strategic plan alive. Like it doesn't go on someone's desk and um, gets shoved away. Now, now we don't print any of that out. It sits in, your, in a file somewhere um, digitally, but so that it, it's a real document. It sort of propels the district and moves it forward. Um, and you have to do that by bringing it up um, and asking people, how are we moving that forward? Um, we work really hard to have a throughway too, so that the strategic plan of the district mirrors the leader's goals, should mirror the superintendent's goals, should mirror all the leaders at the leadership level. And then principals should be communicating their goals, which are based on that plan, to their teachers, and teachers are also basing their goals, their professional practice goals, student learning goals on those um, goals somehow. So that there's a through way. We're all working towards a common vision. Um, and, and that's where we're gonna see the impact, right? When we're all working together, um, it'll look different, right? What it looks like in a K or a first grade classroom will look different than in a high school classroom. My goals will be different than a teacher's, but we're all working towards the same goal and taking incremental steps towards that goal. Um, and that's how we'll see change, is when we're collectively working, there's collective effort. I often talk to teachers about, hey, when we all use the same strategy and there's collective effort, we're going to have more impact. If we all use the same sort of like the same graphic organizer in our middle school classes across content areas, we don't have to explain them over and over again. There's collective effort. And I think the same thing goes with a strategic plan. When there's collective effort, your goals as a school committee are based upon that strategic plan as well, we're going to see impact um, faster, um, and it's going to be more impactful. Yes, Carl. Dr. Adams, um, how have you integrated technology into educational programming in your district? I know you already alluded to technology plans. So. Yeah. Um, so our goal was over three years in our strategic plan to be one-to-one, -one. but that you know changed because we're one, we were one-to-one -one last fall, um, and um, we have Chromebooks K um, through 12. 
Um, and during the pandemic, um, we learned um, really quickly how to create asynchronous and synchronous instruction. We also tried to stay true to our goals around personalized learning and really trying to embed um, choice using um, Google Classroom um, and really using that infrastructure of Google as our platform across K through 12. So our kindergartners would log into their Google Classroom and still do today um, in many of our classes um, to get resources. So our digital literacy and kindergarten are still using Google Classroom as well as our 12th graders, right? And again, that's like that idea of collective effort. If, we're all, if, we, if we can do it in kindergarten and kids are learning those tools all the way through, we're building students, you, they can go deeper and further with the technology skills that they're learning. At the same time, we also learned that we need balance, um, that we need to really be explicit with our young people about how to use technology, not to only to consume information, but also to create, to make change, to use it as a tool of influence for good. Um, our students are being infused and overwhelmed by the amount of information and they need the skills and the tools to critically analyze that information that's coming to them. So we want them to be good consumers, but we want them to go broader and even beyond to use it as a way to communicate, to really connect to the global community that's at their reach right now and do so in order to prepare them for the 21st century skills and jobs that have yet to be created. Um, and so um, we're working towards finding what the balance is um, around how much technology to use and how much to really highlight the personal connection. Um, things have changed and I think they're gonna change again um, in about six months, but we're trying to really find a good balance because I really feel like sometimes I need kids just to shut the computer and talk to each other. We just need to also build up the skills of communication um, and be able, because then those skills, we can then help them transfer to a technology platform in a different way. And really using technology really purposefully. Um, and we still have a lot more work to do um, with that as well. You're welcome. for operate, maintain, evaluate, and supervise improvements to school and district facilities. Hingham is currently involved in two MSBA projects, an accelerated repair and a core project. Can you tell us about any experience you may have planning and renovating or rebuilding, or how you would approach the critical issues this brings? Um. My tenure in Melrose, we've had about $21 million um, in building projects. Um, we also had a Windows project in one of our buildings um, from the MSBA, as well as an MSBA grant um, to redo our science labs. I think it was eight years ago. I'm not sure if they're still doing that grant program, um, but uh, which was phenomenal because we were able to, um, along with the educators, design a space that eight years ago we thought was cutting edge. I'm not sure it's cutting edge anymore. Um, but uh, we d were able to design a space for the educators that really propelled our science program with the technology that they needed, um, the resources, um, some really um, um, innovative um, um, ability to create, do some labs, writing classes, um, and use the space and really create flexible spaces um, for learning as well as we had increased enrollment um, in our, our elementary grades and we had to add modulars to three buildings in order to add additional classrooms in order to um, address growing improvement. And I really feel that the role of, um, our role was really to shepherd and make sure um, that the classroom spaces that were being created would meet the needs currently right, of our students, but also look forward, right? You want those spaces um, to be um, applicable 70 years, 50 years down the line. Um, and you want to be looking ahead and forward, as well as being true to making sure that teachers are getting the classroom spaces that they need in order to do their work. It's a tremendous opportunity right now to think about creating flexible learning environments that are really going to meet the needs of, um, um, of our student body 
creating environments where students, um, we, where we reduce barriers and students can get more access to learning. Um, as well as, at the same time, the role is around really monitoring and making sure and being honest and transparent about those expenses and how the funding is used. So that helps, right? You want a building project to go well because you are going to have another one, right? You're going to have another ask of your town and your community, and you want to make sure that you're transparent about what's happening all along the way so that um, people have trust, right? So that when you go for the next ask, they say, yes, we, we know that that was a good investment and we know that process. Um, one of the things that's happening in the, town, in the town where I live that I love is they're building a public safety building and every week the town manager is sending an update of the progress and what's happening. And it's so it feels, I don't read every single one of them, but I feel like it's a very transparent process. You know exactly what's happening, how it's happening, um, and how the finances are being used. And I think that's the type of transparency and trust the community really wants. Um, and that's my role, right, to be there and be the, um, the, the, the gardener of that um, financing and, that, um, and really making that as transparent and holding um, everyone accountable to that um, and asking questions to that process. You're welcome. My turn. Yes. Uh, Hingham has approximately 650 students on individual education plans. But as a district, we have work to do to make sure that these kids are fully included in the academic and extracurricular life of our schools. Can you talk about concrete steps you have taken in your district to Im uh, improve to ensure that special education students are fully included in the life of the school? Yeah, in our, um, and I know you're all working on your MTSS um, model um, for academics and social emotional learning. Um, in our academic um, um, MTSS model, um, our tier one says access to the gen ed curriculum. So in, in every place, um, um, our first mantra is that every student, including our um, special education students, have access to tier one instruction. The general ed, the core instruction, they need to be there for the reading um, whole group. Um, they need to have access to the standards. Um, in their tier two and tier three, that's where they get their specialized supports. Um, and when um, one of the things we know is our teachers often struggle to include often sometimes our students with special needs in tier one instruction. Um, and as a district, we've been using um, and thinking about universal design for learning. Um, and really thinking about and helping teachers to plan their instruction. And it's a different way for those of us who are educators to think about planning, right? We didn't plan um, with, we sort of plan our objectives and then we plan activities to meet those objectives. This is a different way of planning is sort of we plan with the students in mind and we plan thinking ahead what are the barriers. We would often wait for students to struggle and then sort of try to intervene. This is like we're planning ahead of time because we know there will be students in our classrooms that are going to struggle. We know there are students who might have attentional challenges. We know there are students who have executive functioning um, um, challenges. Um, we know that there are students who might not be able to read a particular text who are a little bit below. So we anticipate those and we plan for those. Um, and then we try to reduce those barriers by providing just-in-time scaffolds, by providing and thinking about how do we provide multiple ways of representation, multiple ways of expression, and multiple ways for students to engage in the content. Um, and trying to help teachers um, do that really purposely. Um, in Melrose, we've had success by saying that there are core instructional practices that we all use. Now, that, says, that said, it looks different in every classroom. Um, but when the students with special needs are doing those core instructional practices in kindergarten and first and second, they become second nature. And, and students are, are more apt to have success. One of those might be we have a strong focus on accountable talk in our district, uh, in beginning even in K. Um, and so in kindergarten, we're starting with accountable talk, that kids are talking to each other um, in, in math and in English, in ELA, 
Um, imagine what they do in 12th grade, right? We're building up that muscle, and our students with special needs are, can have more success in the classrooms with those scaffolds. Um, I really am a, um, a very strong um, believer and have worked passionately to make sure that our special education students have access to the core curriculum, but also to their peers. We have so much to learn from our special education students about their resiliency, um, about um, their way they are so often creative problem solvers, um, as well as um, they have so much to learn from our gen ed peers. And when that has to be a purposeful, planned, inclusive plan to make that happen. Um, and when it does, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, and we in Melrose have more work still to do that. Um, but are working towards that vision of, of fully including and, and supporting our special needs students. Thank you. Yes. Um, so the COVID-19 pandemic has had an unprecedented impact on education and it has affected the lives and well-being of students, teachers, and administrators alike. Uh, additionally, Hingham historically performs well on standardized testing and the district has received several awards speaking to its academic achievements. Uh, unfortunately, this has led to a great deal of stress on the student end. So I'd like to ask, how have you supported student and staff social emotional health while still promoting high student achievement, and how would you carry that over here? I, th I think um, one of the things we did at our high school um, in response to that we had multi students taking multiple APs, we added a um, in the schedule something called a focus lab that was supported by a teacher um, that was a time um, for students to get support on their APs. So it was an embedded time within the, um, the schedule that allowed students who were taking multiple APs to have time um, to get support. Um, we also added on our middle school and high school a flex block, um, which also um, allowed students to have embedded within the school day a time where they could also get support. Um, that's where some academic support can happen, as well as um, things that need to happen across the team to support social-emotional learning. Um, I'm so proud of our um, high school that um, we had done an advisory many years ago um, and um, then um, um, it did, did away with it. Um, but we brought it back this year. Um, so our students at the high school um, start every Monday in an advisory. Um, and it's a group of 12 to 15 kids. Every, every educator in the whole building has an advisory. Um, and the purpose is to sort of be like a soft landing, is sort of like, let's talk about your week, what's coming up. Um, we use Aspen to track grades. So, hey, open up Aspen and look at what, what assignments you're missing. Um, and so having that prompting from another adult to sort of help, how are you gonna organize your week? Who are you gonna see before and after school? How are your grades? Um, and really try to build smaller communities within a large comprehensive high school. It's about relationships. Um, we need every child to be touched by an adult, right? And that gets harder in our middle school and high school because they're large and more comprehensive. At the middle school, you have the team structure, which allows that more personal touch. It's a little smaller and a little more enclosed. Um, but at the high school, you know, you, you need that, per you need a caring adult, right? Someone who just, is checking on you and often students will say um, and young adults will say that's what made the difference is really just having someone who was checking in on them often that role has been played by coaches um, for athletics but not all, not all students are in sports um, and and we want to make sure that our students have that caring adult that's um, taking care of them um, we've also been able um, to add, and we've made that a priority in our budgets, adding guidance counselors at our high school, um, social school adjustment counselors or social workers also to our elementary. We're happy to have at each of our elementaries now a social worker um, who's able to support both students and families with the resources they need um, when there are concerns and, and sort of helping to support teachers as well in meeting the needs of the students. Yep. Um, as superintendent and hang on, you would be a member of the town leadership team. Mm -hmm. Could you share with us any experiences you have working with and collaborating with municipal leaders? So in, um, 
we um, share in Melrose multiple departments with the city. Um, we don't have a human resources office, so we, um, um, we share that with the city, as well as our technology department and our DPW. Our DPW is um, in charge of our custodial services. They fall in our uh, Department of Health. Our nurses fall under the Department of Health. So it requires collaboration um, all the time. Um, and to do so means um, meeting and communicating with folks and, and checking in to make sure needs are met. Um, really seeing my role to sort of support that communication, making sure um, that principals um, are having their needs met um, and facilitating that communication on an ongoing basis as well as any other town departments. Um, we also um, engage our school resources officers um, a lot. They were extremely helpful during the pandemic in doing wellness checks on students um, that we hadn't heard from um, and checking in on students. And also you, seeing those school, our school resource officers are an amazing part of our middle school and high school. They're, they're, you know, they're part of our school, not only to help us advocate for students and student needs, but also to really, um, support and make sure that our buildings are safe. Um, and really looking at all of our buildings, we use our school resource officers, K-12, to really help us think about um, our lockdown procedures, our fire drills, um, our evacuation drills, and making sure that we're prepared um, for any incident um, that might happen so that there's confidence both by staff and the leadership about what 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 might happen. What what will we do if there's an emergency in this setting? And our school resource officers, um, as well as our fire chief, are enormous. And and it requires co uh, constant communication, um, as well. Um, we also, you know, in a in, in a city structure, have to go to the CFOs. And here, in this case, it's the town manager to um, really have a transparent and ongoing communication around budget and what are the needs of the schools with each of those departments um, and really being transparent about these are the needs of the schools and these are our um, needs um, and, um, um, and really advocating um, with them about those. is one of the key components to a successful school district and the Kingham community has high expectations for dynamic, effective, and transparent communications from the superintendent. Can you detail us for us your communication strategy or approach and what role do, do you think like social media plays in a district's communication plan? Um, I think social media is a necessity whether we agree with it or not. It just is. Um, I think um, in order to reach all of our constituents, um, we have to use all of the platforms because any communication person will tell you that they just meet different demographics. Um, so I'm not a big Instagram user, but my daughter is, and I realize that if we want to reach the young adult, I got to go back on Instagram, um, and she is my <laughs> little manager of Instagram every now and then. She'll post p p pictures for me and say, well, wh what should we say about this? And she'll comment for me. But that's reaching your young adults, right? Um, and your Twitter is reaching the next group above, and your Facebook is reaching those my age, right? Um, so um, that's a necessity. Um, it's a way um, to get small pieces of information, not a way to really elaborate, but you're able to paint a small picture about things that are happening in the schools. Again, this is how you create that positive narrative, right? Um, you create this buzz around, hey, what's happening at the middle school with this? Or, um, we were in a school today, and um, they were doing some great, um, they were doing basketball to the Nutcracker. And I'm like, oh, this would be great to take a little snippet of it and share. Um, and because it just creates, it makes school seem like a joyful and an energy, and we're doing good work, right? You're doing great work. You've got to showcase it. And it creates that narrative of the positive things that are happening, and people feel connected um, to the work that's being done. They're also connected to their tax dollars. This is their tax dollars and work, right? Um, as well as I think there needs to be predictability um, to our communication. So um, I send to my staff, I send, um, I tried to do it on Friday, but it's ending up to be Sunday nights. I Sunday nights, I send a, a weekly memo and say, here are some resources and here are the things that are coming up. 
Um, I also do um, a family newsletter on, a, on my role right now. I do it on a monthly basis. And my purpose in that is to really create a narrative around all the great things that are happening in the academic areas, both at our elementary and our middle school. Because um, what often happens in our high school, what often happens is folks will say, well, I didn't know you were doing that. Um, and um, well, we, we, yeah, we're doing that and a lot. Um, for example, right now, as the dyslexia guidance has come out from the state, we've had a lot of questions from our CPAC to say, well, what are you doing with the dyslexia guidelines and how are you tearing instruction? I'm like, yeah, we've been doing that for quite a while in Melrose. We have um, benchmark assessments and that benchmark assessment is one of the tools um, suggested by the state and it's really an example of like we're doing that but people don't know. It's time consuming um, and I think um, one of the things, and I know you have, you, know, you have the gift of a communications officer um, now in um, Hingham, um, it's time consuming. And I think what's hard about it is, is making time, but it's imperative work um, in our jobs to make time for that. Um, the way I do it is I ask people, everybody to contribute something so that it doesn't feel as overwhelming. It's not, just doesn't fall on one person. Hey, everybody contribute like a paragraph or two about something that's happening in your department that we can then share. And then the real work is just putting it together so that it looks um, professional to, to the families. I've got the next one. Um, we are currently in our second year of our equity and inclusion audit. How have you, in your past experience, been involved with movements like this within the school system? And what do you think is the most difficult part of diversity, equity, and inclusion work in a school district? And what would you prioritize in your first year? Um, in uh, Melrose, we've been working for many years. We've done an enormous amount of training of our staff um, um, for at least six years. Um, and in, in last year, we reinvigorated that training and did 12 hours of all staff, um, paraprofessionals, teachers, our secretaries, our everybody, leaders, all went through 12 hours of training and it was focused on identifying microaggressions in our community and how do we address microaggressions when we see them in our community? How do we be allies in this community? Um, and that was kind of like baseline training. Um, and while we've been doing that professional development work of teachers, one of the things we, we noticed is that while we were doing that work, we were asking teachers to make changes, but as a system, we weren't looking systemically. We weren't looking at policies and procedures that allow inequities to happen. Um, so two years ago, we set up um, a DEI task force, a year and a half ago, because um, we said if we're really serious, and all of us would say, if you went to Melrose, we would say we are striving to be equitable and inclusive. And if we are striving to that, if we really believe that, then we got to do the real work and the additional work of looking at our systems, our policies, and our procedures that allow inequities to happen. Um, and so we started with, um, and we were lucky to be part of a DSE um, in a academy that provided us some coaching and support as well. Um, but we started with, they asked us to identify one goal. And um, so we started that process and we went out and we met with multiple stakeholders. We have a racial justice coalition of community members in Melrose. We have a human rights commission that we met with. Um, we met with PTOs, um, we met with staff, our leadership, and we started to just listen um, to what their concerns were and what they were hearing. Um, and we did that, we have a practice of restorative um, practices and um, community circles in our district. And we did so with an intent to listen um, and really understand where folks were um, coming from and what their concerns were. As a result, we took that feedback and developed a plan um, that next month we'll be presenting to the school committee, um, which is focused around the things that we heard. We heard from our community. They want us to think about seriously hiring um, more diverse staff that is reflective of our community, to continue the work that we've already started to make our curriculum reflective of, of the diversity of our community and beyond, um, to think about how do we look at our data with an equity lens um, so that where, when and where disproportionality exists, we are starting to think about how do we address that. 
um, and really outlining those goals so that we can then present them. Um, and we, we also outlined those goals and went back to the community. And one of the feed, some of the feedback our community gave us was that it didn't emphasize enough neurodiversity. Our families told us when we met with them the second time, they really highlighted um, that sometimes our students with neurodiverse needs um, don't feel included in our schools and in the community. Um, so we went back and, and have added that in that revision that when we think about equity, we need to think about racial and cultural um, diversity, but also thinking about, and we had already thought about gender identity, but we also needed to include our neurodiverse students as well. And so that feedback, um, and so this, we only created a one-year plan. Our hope is to create another plan um, for the following year um, based upon this one, and then ship shepherd it into our strategic plan um, so that it gets integrated into our work. But we wanted to highlight it as something different because we wanted to really um, elevate it. Just like we had a technology plan as something separate because we wanted to elevate and highlight those resources, we wanted to elevate this as something really important. Um, um, and I, I don't think I said the fourth goal around professional development, continual professional development around our teachers and also our school leaders. Um, that they're also thinking about the systems and procedures um, and inequities in our community and are striving to make changes. Um, and some of those changes are long-term, making changes in our program of studies, making changes in how students are placed um, in certain courses, um, looking at our discipline practices, um, looking at our special education referrals, who's being referred and who's not being re referred, and is there is a, an imbalance there? You're welcome. The next question. Please describe a time when you successfully reconciled a difference between a union position and a school committee position. And what strategies did you use to achieve the positive outcome? Hmm. A union position. Um, in Melrose, we have a structure of labor management. Um, and we use that structure um, often um, we have a district labor management, and then we have school-based labor management. Um, and we're at the school base, they'll meet with the principal, group teachers will meet union representation, and other teachers will meet with principals. And at the district level, it's central office, um, some principals and teachers, and union leadership. And we use that structure to sort of identify concerns. So they'll bring up concerns. Um, and then we mutually work to sort of solve them and communicate around them um, so that they don't, you don't feel that they, you have to go to a grievance process to get your concern answered. And so we've been able to address um, um, things at that level so that we don't reach um, um, that point. Um, I think at times, um, um, I'm trying to think of one. We have, um, right now we're working on um, um, our elementary schedule. Um, there were concerns around um, the way the elementary specialists were scheduled. Um, and as a result, I'm now involved. We haven't come to a resolution yet, um, but um, we had one meeting um, and we used our practice of community circles to sort of just hear the concerns. We heard the concerns of um, the school leaders. We heard the concerns of the teachers. Um, we started the process, we ran out of time, of brainstorming what are the potential solutions. Um, we agreed to meet um, four more times, um, four to five more times throughout the year. Um, in sort of trying to identify what the needs were um, and some concerns and hurt feelings that are, we're gonna need to do some healing, um, but that is gonna take time. And so we're gonna meet and meet and try to address those concerns and build consensus so we can move forward, right? We, we can't fix the schedule for this year. <laughs> um, it was done with good faith around trying to meet um, all the concerns and trying to figure out how to do this returning from a pandemic. But then how, what do we need to do for next year so that people feel that they've been heard and we can address as many concerns as we can. Sometimes we can, we just have to be honest and transparent to say, we didn't address this concern and this is why. Um, and sometimes folks may not like that answer, but just to be honest and transparent about the why and having a sense of being heard, I think is important. And I think staff really appreciate that. Thank you. What role do you believe the school staff should play in decision making? How have you involved 
your staff in the decision-making process? Um, they should be involved in every step of the decision-making. Um, in I um, am a firm believer around really trying to build up teacher leaders and teacher leadership in buildings so that they, if we want them to implement, then we gotta get them involved in what it looks like. Um, while I was an educator, I was an educator a long time ago in a classroom and it's a hard job. And so they need a voice at the table to say, if we wanna design, for example, um, MTSS and tiered systems of supports, we need their feedback. What does this look like? How do we do this? Um, what are the resources we need? Um, and at times saying, oh, bringing in others to add expertise um, and add other voices so that they can see the breadth. Sometimes when we've only been in our space, we only see what's possible from that lens. So trying to also to sort of help staff to see the broader lens about other possibilities about how we can do school and be effective in our roles um, is also important. I really feel that that's my role is sort of supporting and shepherding staff to say, okay, that's great, but maybe there are other ways we can do that. Maybe there's other ways we can be successful um, as well. Um, we have a structure of many teacher committees um, where teachers have a voice in the district's professional development, um, curriculum, um, technology, um, and they're helping shepherd and develop the plans, um, and they have a voice in it. And then sharing back, because not everybody's at the table or not everybody's able to be at the table, sharing back to staff, oh, here's some of the things we discussed. Um, for example, right now, we're in the midst of budgets, and we've had conversations with our instruction technology committee and our curriculum committee about what are the technology tools they're actually using and which ones we're using and not using to the greatest extent that don't make economic sense anymore. We use them during the pandemic. For example, one of them is um, Screencastify that allows us to screencast videos. Um, and we had a discussion about that. It's, it's being used by some, but not all. And looking at the amount it costs us, it doesn't make sense for us to pay for that. And um, there are some other free tools that are just as good. So um, something called Flipgrid. We don't need, Flipgrid has the ability to do almost everything that Screencastify does. We don't need that tool anymore. Um, and so involving teachers in that decision, hey, we're not going forward with this and this is why um, this is our current usage and getting their feedback. Um, and, and that's one way sort of um, involving them in sort of helping Shepard um, and but they also at the same time said, hey, can we have access to this tool? We really feel this tool, um, and in this case, it's actually um, much more economical. Um, can we have this tool? Because we really feel this tool will help shepherd um, some, of the, some of our goals around having students access technology for the purposes of creation um, and collaboration and communication in a broader sense. Sure. Uh, outside of the teachers, yep. what other staff have you uh, reached out to uh, to help you in the decision making process? We um, have a very strong leadership team that I rely on um, a tremendous amount. Um, for example, um, one of the things we've noticed is um, we have we also don't have a director of human resources. So I've learned a lot about human resources in the last um, six to eight months. Um, we don't have a standard way of hiring. So when I hired four new curriculum directors, each one said, what is our process for hiring? What are the questions I should ask? What are the forms we should ask? And we all had been doing similar things, but slightly different. Um, and again, if we want to have equitable hiring practices, then we all need to have some agreed upon ways that we do the interview process. Um, and so one of the things we did as a leadership team is say, okay, we, we gathered examples of other hiring handbooks from districts and started to ask the leadership team to help craft what would it look like for us to have a hiring ha handbook? What are the components? So we started, I asked them to draft a table of contents. What would you want in this particular document that would be helpful? Um, as, as a person who's hiring staff. What are the best practices for hiring that we have in common and that we want to highlight and share and make common around our practices? Um, and so we're developing that and working on it together. 
Um, and so we have a draft after three meetings, and now we're going to go, you know, try to sort of massage it and make it even better. So our hope is by the time we get to spring, we have a document in common best practices about hiring um, that we were doing in sporadic ways. We all had ways that we did the process, um, but it will allow us, and then it will allow us to support new administrators who come in and say, here's the way we do hiring. Um, instead of feeling like we're all doing different things. And I believe it will, and we're doing it with a lens about how do we make those processes equitable. Um, and I believe it's one step, only one step, to help us get closer to that goal. Okay, the next question. Uh, school budgets reflect what is valued in educating our children. Looking at the budget of Hingham Public Schools, what do you see our district valuing? As superintendent, would you maintain the current values or implement changes to those values? If changes in the budget, where and why? Um, so I think I've said before, you're below the state average in your per pupil expenditures. Um, but it looks like you have valued very much what happens in the classroom. And you certainly, um, you've increased interventionists and supports in classrooms. So it really shows that that's what you value. Um, and I also value very much what happens in classrooms and have worked um, in my career to make sure that we're really honoring the work of teachers and making sure they have the resources they need. Really trying to propel that they have all the best curriculum materials that really aligns with the best and what we know. Um, and so I would continue those values around really honoring and respecting. Um, you have great class sizes in most cases. Um, and you really are valuing that student-teacher relationship and what happens in the classroom. You've also invested as a district in some leadership um, and some resources that you really will feel like will propel um, um, the leadership in being successful. You have curriculum directors um, across your grade spans, and that's a strong value because if we, if we want to help teachers be better at their craft, we need folks who are dedicated to being experts. Um, and can provide leadership, right? And uh, uh, my role at the superintendents and my, the leadership level is to make sure those folks are continually developing their craft to better meet the needs of our students. Our students are changing um, rapidly. Their needs are changing. And we as educators need to also be changing to meet their needs. Um, the, it, I feel like it used to be like you, like I feel like education is changing every three to four years. And it used to feel like you had some grace period, but you don't anymore. We constantly need, need to be learning. And you've invested in folks. Um, I saw when I met with them, the leadership team, you've invested in folks that you believe should be leaders of their content or their curriculum area and really provide leadership. Um, and so my role is to really help shepherd them and help them continue learning and really shepherd them towards that common vision um, that we've agreed to a, as a community that hopefully will be outlined in your strategic plan um, and really say, this is our vision. So let, let's get working and how do we move our staff and our community towards that vision? You want your budget to also align with that strategic vision um, and really have that strategic vision propel that budget moving forward as well. Um, and I imagine your strategic plan is really going to be envisioning around some of the goals I've already heard and seen today, right? Focusing on making sure you're creating equitable and inclusive learning environment, making sure all students have access um, to the best learning, um, really shepherding students toward those 21st century skills around being good communicators, problem solvers, being creative, um, highlighting responsible citizenship in the community and beyond. And I imagine guessing that your strategic plan will shepherd, will be leaning in that way. And it feels like your budget is trying to reflect that um, as well. Thanks. Um, so one of, one of the great things about the town of Hingham is that we have an absolute wealth of talent in the town in terms of not just individuals, which we definitely have, but the or private organizations in town. We have the Hingham Unity Council, which works towards diversity and equity. We have the Hingham Educational Foundation, which does fundraising for school programs. We have the CPACs, the PTOs, all this. 
Uh, I was wondering, uh, can you talk about how you've harnessed the talent of local organizations and individuals to improve the schools in your district? Yeah, so we, um, um, when we were developing our equity plan, really used many of the same, some similar groups in Melrose to really help us give us feedback. And we were asking for honest feedback about what they were hearing, what the needs were. Um, and really trying to amplify those voices um, and, and trying to help us um, develop those plans so that it really felt responsive to what was really happening. Um, an important voice also, I would say, is students, including students, and having structures that students can also give us feedback. Um, I think we often forget how powerful um, their voices can be. Um, we have a structure that um, I would um, want to replicate where um, I was um, a leader, um, where we have um, PTOs meet on a monthly basis with the superintendent um, and as a group um, to sort of think about and share concerns and what they're hearing. It's sort of, um, it includes CPAC, it includes our ELL PAC, is really using that group as a way to say, this is, and we use them also to give us feedback on our diversity um, plans um, and our strategic overview over time um, is using that group to sort of help frame um, and getting advice from them and helping them create and share the narrative and but also being responsive they're, they're going to hear things and say things and, and you know it's, it gives a forum for that to be heard um, and they can be allies right we look at, the more we communicate and have shepherds of this work out in the community the more successful we'll be in, in sort of really sharing that vision and getting support for that vision right it's our role to sort of communicate over and over again um, in multiple ways um, and by bringing those groups together it's an amazing way um, to really um, develop and harness people who can go out and be your like ambassadors um, in the world. And now with it being so easy to do virtual meetings, we've learned how to do that. It's, there's no excuse, right, for not using those platforms to bring people together um, to really um, uh, work together, right? Let's harness those folks. We also have a structure in Melrose called The Bridge. Um, and it's a person, she's paid part-time um, but she coordinates all our volunteers, um, does, um, supports the Cori checking, supports um, when, um, for example, at our middle school, we did a girls in STEM program um, in order to address in our higher level courses at the high school, we have less girls. Um, and we know that begins in middle school, right? In middle school, students are getting the message, science and math, STEM is for them or not. Um, and so we did a series um, where every day um, they could see three to four women in STEM professions. Um, and we did that virtually. And our, the bridge person was really helpful in, in helping identify people in the community um, who are working in STEM professions, who can really hire women um, and really be role models for our, um, for our young people, all young people, about um, real world experiences and really finding those opportunities um, in Melrose, another example is we have, um, cap, we're trying to get capstone projects um, from grades three to 12. So every year students would have a sort of capstone that helps um, in grades three to five, it's a passion project. Um, in grade eight, it's their civics project. Grade um, 11, it's their civics project. 10th grade, they have an ELA project um, that's focused around um, an ism that they're researching and studying. Um, but those are all great ways to bring in the community, right? Um, and really engage the community. And when community members have that interaction with the students, the, st the schools become real, right? They, they're real people in those schools and real young people that really benefit um, from the resources that we're providing. Um, and those folks now become advocates. Hey, I met the student and they're doing this work at the, it's really exciting. Um, and really creating that buzz. So that ability to bring, and that's been harnessed now with the pandemic. We can so easily bring so many people into our students' classrooms. Um, and leveraging that um, is pr very, very powerful. Because people say, that, there's great things going on there. Um, I was there, I saw this, these students' projects, and it creates a, a very positive um, buzz. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Liz. Yeah, I know. <laughs>
I have no idea what number. Can you tell me what number? What number? Uh, 16. Okay. Yes. Oh, and I'm yeah. way ahead. Yeah. No, we, this, this is great. We have some, uh, we have some other questions in the community to get to. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Here we go. Uh, so recently, uh, several new music classes have been added to the program of studies to be implemented next year, uh, because Hingham is a community that often prides itself on its arts programs. Uh, but despite the impressive slate of both fine and applied arts and the pride, uh, only a single semester of an arts class is required for graduation, which is by far the lowest in our area. So I was wondering what your views are on the arts in schools and would you want to perhaps increase that requirement as superintendent? Yeah, I believe we require at least two years, but I'm not sure now that you only say it's one semester is kind of, and that's, and that's common around, it kind of surprises me because I'm pretty sure we require two years. But now I'm doubting myself because I'm like, wow, only one semester. Um, I have a 15-year-old daughter who's a visual artist. Um, I have a son who's an athlete um, in everything sports. He's it. Um, three sports, and that's, you know, he thrives. When he couldn't play sports during the pandemic, he, he, he was struggling because he was missing his outlet. School is about that social, physical action, and he was missing it. I could see that. But I could also see with my 15-year-old, the visual arts, how she started to use the visual arts to express her concerns. Like, like, like most many teens, I saw my young person be more withdrawn, more quiet, spending a lot of time on their devices. And then I started to watch some of her visual work, artwork, and I'm like, can you tell me a little bit more about what's going on here? And sometimes she's 15, 14 at that time, she would say, no, mom, and not talking to you, but I, you know, be persistent. And what she was communicating was a sadness about what she had lost. So I am a very firm um, proponent of the power of the arts, and I watch her creativity, her ability to solve problems, her ability to physically see things in ways that I just don't have that. And so it's enormously powerful um, and important that our students have access to the arts. It, all, it brings joy to her. So it's important for some students um, and to have that outlet, just like it is for athletics. Um, but in addition, the ability and creativity and um, communication and collaboration many of the arts require are the skills that we need for the 21st century. Um, and so the arts are a means for that. Um, we also need to be thinking really critically how um, other content areas integrate the arts. Um, for example, in our um, um, history, um, um, we just redesigned all of our history curriculum, creates K through, K through 11, 10. We're working on 11th and 12th grade. Um, but a kindergartner can access um, a painting and use a painting to talk about um, um, something in their social studies curriculum. So integrating the art and use the arts to express themselves. It's a way for students to multiply, another means for students to express what they've learned um, and represented. So I vitally think it's important. One of the things we, we had a fine arts program review last year. Um, and one of the things we noticed, for example, in our elementary curriculum, most of our elementary curriculum focused on the practice of singing. Um, and uh, having one, two kids who sat at many concerts and mouth the words, you were not one of them, right, Elijah? Uh, who would mouth the words and not sing. Um, I know that singing's not for everyone. So we learned through that process that our music teachers needed access to more resources. Um, we were able to use the foundation grant to add ukuleles. Um, and I saw ukuleles somewhere in my travels today. Um, to our curriculum. We're working on um, thinking about how do we fund ORF instruments, which I think are a great, th I, I guess are a great also percussion way um, students can interact with music. Um, and try to add more physical components so that students don't just see music as just this vocal tradition. Um, but for some people, it has to be physical. It has to be active. It's another means for them to see and create music. Um, that we didn't necessarily give our students access to and so that we're trying to build. And that's going to help build up our music program because students are going to see, hey, 
I can play the ukulele. I can play another instrument. Um, I've learned how to read music um, and build and strengthen the numbers in our music program. Because of the pandemic, we lost quite a few and we're trying now to build up our music program again um, um, in our elementary so that we'll have a strong feeder program to our middle school and our high school. So we have a number of questions from the community and we just wanna thank everyone who sent them in. We had uh, over 25 um, and they're great. Some of them were covered by our questions tonight, so and we'll get to as many as we can. For anyone who came in late, if you have a question, there's a form over there. You can just write it down and hand it to Tim. We'll ask that. Um, the first one comes from our CPAC, the Special Education Parent Advisory um, Committee. Recent data has shown that a low percentage of special education students are in higher level classes at the high school. What would you do as superintendent to ensure higher level classes are more accessible to special education students and students on IEPs? Yep, we have um, a similar um, concern um, that we're working on. Um, it um, doesn't begin at the high school. It begins in elementary and then also in middle school. Um, so we have to take a broader view. I'll give you an example of um, something that we're trying to do to make college level courses to really send them that anyone who wants to take a college level course could. Um, we have, um, in Melrose, um, over many years, we had leveled classes in our middle school worked. It took us five years um, to unlevel our courses at the middle school, but we did it slowly. Um, and um, we also um, are in our second year of unleveling our ninth grade. Um, so all of our courses in the ninth grade are unleveled. Some students in ninth grade, if they'd like, can take an um, AP Euro course or an a and an AP Bio if if they meet certain criteria, but our AP courses are open enrollment. So anybody who wants to take it and want to do the work, they can take it. Um, um, the, but I was going to tell you the English example. Um, we um, have almost 230 students, 38 students who are taking AP Lang um, in um, 11th grade. Um, and our population is about 300. So we're really close to almost all students taking it. So our plan is next year, all of our 11th graders, their English course is going to be AP Lang. Um, and we're also talking about how do we create a pathway um, so that all of our students have access to, if they want to take a college level course, you can. Um, and planning, um, thinking about um, implementing the pre-AP, there's a pre-AP curriculum um, for our middle school. Um, and the purpose of that is to give middle schoolers the skills they need, the strategies and skills that they need in order to be successful in AP courses. So our ninth grade would be unleveled. Our 10th grade would also be unleveled, but it would be also a pre-AP course. So it would be a course to say, here you're going to learn the strategies and skills you need to be successful. And your 11th grade would be your AP Lang course. And 12th grade students could take AP literature. Um, we're also hoping. Um, we're one year out to restructure our 12th grade so that um, it's more choice based so students could take um, some of the electives that students don't often um, take because there's not enough enrollment. So a course on women's studies, um, a course on African American literature, um, a course on mystery novels, um, and really giving students some choice in that last year um, of courses they would like to really go deeper into and really um, really go after a passion, right, as they go off um, into thinking about going on to college. Um, so that kind of sends the message that, hey, everybody can take a course, um, no matter at a college level course. You can go to college if you want um, across all our um, subgroups um, and students. We've also been thinking a lot about um, dual enrollment courses. I didn't see if you had, you do have some dual enrollment courses um, where students can take a course, um, um, their, their course will count um, for credit, but it will also count for college credit. Um, we already do that for our world languages, so students in their fifth year um, in Melrose High School take a world language, who take a world language, can also take it for credit. They can pay for the credit um, for either Salem State or UMass Boston we have connections with. We've been thinking about that more for more courses, um, because a lot of colleges are not taking AP anymore credit. Um, and it's more valuable to say, hey, I've got six, seven credit, six or nine credits from college already going. It can save you some money when you're going off to college. 
Um, and so we're doing some thinking about, you know, thinking about dual enrollment instead of AP. It also allows more flexibility in the curriculum um, and, and not being tied to that AP curriculum and course of study. sustainability a strategic priority by integrating climate change action and mitigation into the curricula of all subjects. How will you make sure that our children are adequately equipped to understand and take action in the face of climate change? Yep. Vitally important and I think has um, strong connections to our social studies um, frameworks, curriculum frameworks, and our science curriculum frameworks. Um, the way we've been thinking about that in Melrose, we've been using um, the Learning for Justice Social Justice Standards. Um, and they're organized around four um, themes. One is around identity, making sure our curriculum is ref so that students can see themselves reflected in, their cur in the curriculum. Diversity, that they can see the diversity of the community and the wider community. Um, the third one is social justice. They can identify um, issues of social justice both within the community and the broader community. And climate change is as a so social justice issue. Um, and the third, fourth is taking action. Right, um, so we have to integrate um, climate change and other social justice, and our students want to talk about these issues. They want the curriculum to be current. They want this is real world and real life. Um, and selfishly, I said this before at some point today. Selfishly, I want to prepare our young people um, to tackle these hard issues um, because we need them to. Um, um, and so we need to integrate this and purposely plan for that. Um, so we've taken significant efforts to think about all of our curriculum documents and curriculum writing around those four themes um, so that we're helping develop those skills. Um, the social studies standards, we've tried to really leverage those um, because they include that civic action piece around really helping students develop those skills that they need in order to be civically engaged to be able to learn how to write a letter to the editor, be able to advocate your senator um, and your representative for change, understanding local needs and national needs, um, and really highlighting. And I've been impressed with um, the projects our students are coming up with. They, they can do this. Um, we just have to provide the space and the knowledge and the opportunity, and they're going to lead us forward. And that's, our, that's what our work needs to be. Here's one. Uh, please describe an emergency incident you experienced while at school and how you handled it. Um, um, I remember a, a couple of years ago, we were all, and I don't know if Ingham was part of this, we were all getting those bomb threats. Do you remember that? Um, feels like it was a long time ago, but it was probably just three or four years ago. Um, I think we, um, this is where we have to make sure um, that our procedures for emergencies are very clear and that we've practiced them. Um, so making sure that we've practiced our fire drill, our lockdown drills, our emergency um, evacuation drills, um, that staff are really clear on um, where we go if we need to evacuate, and we practice them. Um, and then inform the community that we're practicing them so that we're ready for those um, scenarios. So I remember um, in several instances, we were getting those um, um, bomb um, threats and sort of making sure that we followed our procedure, um, that we informed the community um, and the families of what was happening, um, informed staff, um, and also made space and time to make sure that we were reevaluating how it went so that any incident that happened, we were saying, okay, how did that go? What didn't go well? And make sure we addressed it. Um, so that we're learning from um, that to make sure um, that we're continually developing and strengthening our procedures. So that's the one that comes to, to mind. Um, we've had some instances where some young people have been struggling social emotionally um, and sort of helping um, um, the staff sort of say, oh, we're going to lock down the building or lock down a hallway to make sure um, the, safe, the, per the young person is safe, um, and then communicating to staff um, what's happened and why as much as you can within reins of conf confidentiality um, and sort of making sure that we're communicating. I think communication um, when anything happens is being transparent um, and also being honest when there are times that, hey, we can't 
share information um, because of student confidentiality and being really clear um, about the why you're doing something. Um, and that I think over time people say, oh, we trust that this is what's the, the why and the reasons why people have made decisions they had. Great. Um, Hingham Public Schools has a number of important and worthy priorities to expand and or improve the overall educational experience of our students. For example, a new foster school building, a potential fine arts director, additional staff in K through 12, uh, special education, up-to-date technology and school materials, including books, et cetera. These investments will not only improve the education of students, it will help Hingham schools remain on par with our benchmark communities. The issue is that there is only so much funding to go around. Please share a professional experience where you publicly supported a costly investment in your school system. How did you gain the necessary support from all of the different stakeholders, teachers, administrators, students, parents, community members, and please be as specific as possible? I think um, um, we've done over the years in Melrose some very costly um, curriculum purchases. Um, when we've done so, we've made the argument um, we have to continually um, replace texts because they're just dated um, and they're not no longer meeting the standards um, and really creating um, the narrative that this is what teachers need in order to be effective. Um, we want teachers, um, the, when teachers are out looking for lots of materials and they're piecing together things, we're, it, that um, idea of um, community effort and working together is not there. We don't have aligned curriculum and then we don't meet benchmarks and we're not meeting standards. Um, and we've done that by highlighting, um, in, in some cases, dated curriculum. This is the copyright of that curriculum. Um, these are the outcomes that we're getting currently and we believe strongly um, that implementation of these materials will help support and propel the district in better meeting standards and better meeting the needs of all students. Um, that said, curriculum materials are not the sole piece. Um, it's also the implementation of them. You really want to make sure you're supporting staff um, in implementing materials with fidelity. Um, not that that means everybody's looking the same because every teacher is creative and even though they have similar materials or similar instructional practices, um, their classrooms are vibrant, energetic places um, where teachers in, make different choices about how they're meeting the needs of their students and we want to empower them. Um, but when teachers are looking for resources in multiple places, it doesn't allow them to do the real work around assessment and planning to meet individual needs. Um, and so they need those resources. So I'm a strong advocate, I've been a strong advocate around um, getting materials that allow teachers um, access um, to be able to do the work that they need to do. I think as well, um, we are experiencing churn in our staffing, um, maternity leaves, paternity leaves, um, and in order to have materials for those folks who are taking over, um, we need curriculum materials and well-written curriculum so that folks can walk in and provide um, a similar experience to what the person who, who may not be there. Um, or a new person, right? It's respectful to the new person. If we want a new educator to be successful in a classroom, we have to be able to say, here are some resources that are going to allow you. And it also allows for that effort so that we have vertical and horizontal alignment of our curriculum. Um, one of the things that's also important, when I started in Melrose, we had five elementary schools and we had five different curriculums going on. Um, and so parents and teachers were all comparing schools um, and we really wanted, the, the, we wanted individual schools and cultures, but we also wanted parents and families to have a common experience, right? And we're all feeding into one middle school. We need students to have common experiences. Um, in order to be successful as they go up in the grades. Um, and so that was also something um, that was important in creating um, a narrative. In some cases, we were able to do that over multiple years um, and sort of slowly do it so that we were able to build, um, the budget couldn't sustain a big purchase, but we were able to, over three years, um, do a purchase that allowed us over three years to be in better alignment.
Is there anything else you want us to know about you? It's been a really long day. Yeah, been a long <laughs> day. I'm grateful. I'm grateful to the Hingham community. I'm grateful to all the teachers and the leaders today. They took so much time out of their day um, to spend with me. Everybody's been generous and gracious and kind. Um, this feels like a great place to work, um, and I would love to be here and um, work with all of you as well as um, all the educators. Um, so thank you, and good luck with your decisions. All right.